how do we diagnose neurochogran or chogrin involving the central nervous system? Cerebrospinal fluid or the spinal fluid analysis is very important for the diagnosis of neurochogran. We can see certain changes like your lymphocytes being elevated there, your IgG index being elevated, but less oligoclonal bands. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And we also do blood work. Uh, the blood work that I mentioned before, we test for your ANA, SSA, and SSB antibody. We look at your number of white blood cells. We look to see if you have more gamma globulins. We look to see if you have rheumatoid factor, complement levels. All of these are important to be tested. And what it was seen in patients that have CNS involvement or central nervous system involvement is that not all of them, they have a positive ANA and only 38% will have a positive ANA. About 48% have a positive SSA and only 6% will have a positive SSB antibody. As I just mentioned, in Sjogren that affects your brain and your spine, only 40 to 50% of them will have a positive SSA antibody, and only 6% will have a positive SSB antibody. And this is important because that makes the diagnosis very challenging. These type of antibodies, SSA antibodies, they actually have been associated with a more aggressive disease of the brain. What does it mean? It means that if you have SSA antibodies with neurological involvement, that could mean that you have a more aggressive disease towards your brain or your spine. We do use other tests like visual evoked potential, which are abnormal in 61% of patients. We use EEG or electroencephalogram, which sometimes has a limited value, but it can be useful to detect subclinical signs of neurological involvement. We also use MRI, and I'm going to take the time to explain to you the value of MRI in neurological involvement of Sjogren. MRIs are more sensitive than CAT scans to detect anatomical abnormalities in primary CNS or primary neurological Sjogren. There are multiple areas of increased signal that will show inflammation specifically located in the subcortical and periventricular white matter. And those lesions are found more frequently in patients that have involvement of their brain. Let me talk to you more about brain MRI findings in Sjogren. I mentioned to you about white matter lesions, and I made the comment that they have to be located in certain areas like periventricular areas. And this makes the diagnosis challenging because some patients with multiple sclerosis, they can have the lesions in the same areas. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. In some patients, we do see signs of cerebral venous thrombosis. And in other patients, we do see tumor-like lesions that are actually not tumor, but there is a sign of Sjogren syndrome. Let's talk about spinal MRIs. Spinal MRIs are ordered to evaluate the spinal cord involvement, and they can show in patients with Sjogren intensities or hyperintensities in the cervical area. Most of the time, 82% of patients will have that problem, or they can have extended lesions in cases of acute myelopathy. This is an MRI of a patient with hypersignal in the cord that is suggestive of acute myelopathy. This is also an MRI from a patient with extensive transverse myelitis. This is also another MRI of a patient with neuromyelitis optica, a patient that also had Sjogren. This is another case of neuromyelitis optica where you can see involvement of the dorsal midbrain and the pontin lesion in a patient with Sjogren that developed neuromyelitis optica. 
We also use combinations of tests like MRI and a voxel-based morphometry. And this is a method commonly used to quantitate and objectively evaluate the differences in regional cerebral volumes. This type of test was able to show that patients with Sjogren had certain areas of white matter hyperintensities, and those areas were also associated with more atrophy. These studies show that patients with primary Sjogren that have this white matter intensities and gray and white matter atrophy, those are probably related to a sort of cerebral vasculitis or inflammation in the vessels of the brain. There are other tests like single photon emission CTs or PET scans that can evaluate the blood flow in the brain. And it was shown that patients with Sjogren, they have reduced cerebral blood flow, they have brain atrophy and decreased glucose metabolism in the brain. In certain patients, neuropsychological testing, it's also very important to evaluate symptoms that are very subtle in affecting the brain. Cerebral angiography is used more rarely in patients with primary Sjogren, but when it was used in 45% of highly selective patients with Sjogren and active CNS involvement, they actually shown to have small vessel vasculitis in the brain.